Okay, sweet. All right. Hey, everybody. Hey, Hi. Uh, well, this is my first talk, and I have uh, my friend Ahmed here to thank uh, for this. He kind of just, uh, you know, told me, do you want to talk to a room full of developers about this? And I was like, oh, it's like you times 50. You know, it's just a, just a <laughs> bunch of, it's a lot of guys, you know, that, you know, like code and code. <laughs> That's about it. But, um, okay, so I am a designer slash freelancer for... Uh, company. Well, actually, let's pull up about me. So I was born in the United States. I was raised in Mexico, though. I was raised up until high school. The reason I speak English is because I learned from the Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. I love the Muppets. And I also love Sesame Street and Big Bird and, on, and all this other stuff that KPBS pulled out. I hate Mexican television with a passion. I hate novellas. And I love the Muppets. And that's the reason why I have a semi-accent, maybe. Um, okay. Started a career in graphic design after switching majors three times. So... I started as pre-med. Uh, I saw that it was, I, was, I would still be in school technically, like 31 maybe, bald at this point. Um, I switched over to English, realized that Tolkien was great, but I just wasn't going to make money at all, just writing books. And uh, one of my good friends told me, you know, you like drawing comics, you like being creative, why don't you become a designer? Mm, all right, so right when you get to the path of uh, in SDSU, you have to choose either to go to liberal arts, or not liberal arts, sorry, just art in general, like sculptor and painting and everything, or you can just become a designer. That's the only thing that's offered. Um, now I, one of my good teachers, I forgot her name, but she was awesome. <laughs> she, uh, she literally told me, you're not an artist anymore, you're a professional. And that's when you find a distinction between, I have to do this for money, not for pleasure anymore. And I mean, at the same time, I do like what I do. It's just that a lot of times I have to, you have to put yourself on a higher pedestal when it comes to respecting yourself <laughs> in the sense of professional. Okay, um, I've had a variety of uh, different jobs. I started as an intern at the Ruben H. Fleet Science Center in Balboa Park. I did an internship for eight months for free. So I had to find ways to get to Balboa Park because I lived in San Ysidro at the time. So it's about 20 to 30 minutes and a trolley ride is about an hour and a half. I read a lot of books, <laughs> read most of Lord of the Rings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, well, it was, it was interesting because I, I was, all you see all those giant banners outside of the museum sometimes? Mm -hmm. I designed those. And then a lot of the stuff uh, for the children's museums, a lot of the graphics in there were, you know, they were awesome. It was awesome to work with kids, so that was great. Um, after that, I became uh, a, I don't know, another intern again, again, a paid internship this time at Evo Nexus, uh, working as a creative designer. It was actually pretty awesome. I, was, I worked for, you know, Evo Nexus, anybody familiar with Evo Nexus here? Okay, awesome. All right, so yeah, I was uh, I worked with a lot of companies there. Uh, that's pretty much what I got my start. Ahmed found me amongst the rubble. You know, <laughs> I was <laughs> I was literally working as a print designer there, and uh, it was it was great. But I wasn't getting much experience in anywhere else because, you know, when you come out of SDSU, their program is so um, old-fashioned that you literally just become a print designer. That's essentially what you are, and that puts you at a very big disadvantage when you come out, come out of college. Most people can't get a job because. You focus so much time on making these pretty portfolios and posters and all this fun stuff, but you realize that everybody's moving on to web and mobile. And by the time my five years were up at SDSU, you know, I did five, <laughs> not four. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, well, I, for a while, I dabbled in film and didn't work out. <laughs> that's that's kind of why. But um, when I got out, I realized that I was already far behind. And at the, at the time, I didn't really, you know, iPhone and Android and all that stuff didn't really appeal to me. Uh, but then Ahmed found me, he's like, can you design for mobile apps? I sure can. And uh, <laughs> it's a blatant lie, but, you know, I got into it. I got, it was pretty awesome. Um, after that, I started working with a lot of the startups that I had at Evo Nexus. And uh, it was a variety of different, that's when I got most of my experience because I saw large startups, you know, crash and crumble. I saw a lot of small startups make it big and, you know, make 18, 20, 30 million rounds, you know. Um, and at the same time, what I liked about it is that I was behind some of the core stuff that they did. Um, some of them moved on, some of them have sold the company, so like I said, my work is just kind of scattered everywhere. Okay, and right now I work <laughs> at classy.org. So I'm a visual designer, I focus on the social media aspects of it. So, um, kind of a, I still do freelance on the side as, as well, but uh, classy.org is a CRM for nonprofits, so it's focused solely on nonprofits. So if you have a nonprofit and you know you want to get known, Classy pretty much is the. It gives you not only the tools, but it also gives you the guides and everything else you need to succeed as a nonprofit. Because a lot of nonprofits they have a horrible website. We teach how to make a better website. Uh, at the same time, our CRM is robust in event ticketing and platform and all that stuff. I'm sorry, I'm giving a commercial right now, but it was literally I had two weeks of sales and just like drilling into my head. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, and that's kind of my life story. All right, UX and UI and why. 
So um, how many people here are familiar with UX and UI? How many of you guys heard it five years before right now? OK, awesome. All right. So when I first got out of San Diego State, I didn't, UX and UI, were f I didn't understand what they were. And until I started working with Ahmed and started hitting the mobile field, I didn't really um, perceive it as something important. A graphic designer is essentially a UX and UI designer. However, that is not what we were called when we were in school. UX and UI, my teachers had no idea what that meant. And so when you, when, you get, when you get out of school, you essentially realize that this is a buzzword in many ways. The reason I tell you this is because I worked at Evo Nexus, and my title for my LinkedIn profile was creative designer. I made the <laughs> bold choice of changing my title from that to, to UI UX designer. Boom, like that, every single day, recruiters calling me, Nate, Nate. it seriously was the word. That was it. It didn't matter experience, it just mattered the fact that you had that word up in there. And that's essentially, it's, it's kind of sad. I mean, really, like most of my friends that still don't have a job, you know, vo voice themselves as visual designers, creative designers, and that doesn't really account for anything. Unless you're this, which essentially you are. You just, <laughs> you just don't know it yet. Uh, okay, so on to UX and UI. So UI makes things look beautiful yet practical. That's essentially what UI is. UI, UI is the interface, the GUI, and how we everything, you know, we experience everything. And most of the time we see, um, you know, Considering how, how fast we're moving with web, it's a lot easier to see good design than bad. Um, but there are still some pretty horrible examples. Like I said, I won't call any names, but I know a few friends that you know, are developers that are not very <laughs> design savvy. That's not their fault. Um, and then what the UX portion of this is, UX makes people think it's practical and logical. So that's what pretty much what you're trying to do. This is a list of things that a UX designer does. If you can see, field research, face-to-face -face interviewing, creating user tests, Product design, feature writing, graphic interaction design, prototyping, creating personas. That's essentially a UX designer. A UI designer is over here. Everything's faded out so you can see kind of, you know. A UX designer is, uh, sometimes isn't re as respected as a UI designer. The reason why is because they're essentially two different mindsets. And you have to be in. That's hard because I think, I, I think I'm a better UI designer than I am a UX designer. But at the same time, I've worked with enough people that I think, uh, what's up, man? How you doing, brother? Yeah. Um, that I can actually say, you know, um, I have a little bit of experience. <laughs> um, so a lot of the stuff here you will probably, uh, you know, probably never heard of. The, the biggest one for me that I, that I realized is that, um, there you go, the goal of UX. The goal of UX is adapt and change a user behavior. So a lot of the times what we focus on as designers is we have to empathize with the user. Uh, but at the same time, we have to consider the fact that we're the one trying to set the trends. And that's the biggest thing is we uh, try, you know, we get feedback from our app, yes, if you, some of the bigger names and, you know, that we have currently in, in, I guess, in mobile is, you know, Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Google, all the guys. Those guys test their stuff day in, day out, and they do betas and everything else. And that's the reason why they're still on top. And that's the reason why we still use them every day. Because they actually, their stuff essentially works on the human side. If you think, think of Instagram, think how easy that thing is. Instagram essentially is it's using your photo application to literally take a picture and add a filter on it. That was essentially the bit. That's the core way that Instagram worked, and it succeeded somehow. <laughs> um, so the goal of UX also is to take a humanistic approach to personas, A-B testing, et cetera. So when I mean personas is that you, and I think you've maybe this have, and developers do this, you create essentially a user profile based on a lot of case studies. So you take like 50,000 or 100,000 people, and then you kind of marginalize them and then divide them up into small groups. And then from there, you create characteristics of, of uh, each, every single one of them. Like this person, you know, likes, you know, video games and everything else. This, therefore, this person will like this. Uh, so you create personas, obviously A-B testing that you guys are familiar with, and a variety of the stuff that we saw on the, on the previous page. So that's essentially what UX uh, design does in a, s I guess, in a small way. And then the other thing is make user not feel the designer's hand. So yes, we are meant to adapt and change user behavior, but we're not here to force people to do that. So it's a gradual change. So if you notice a lot of the stuff that you know, we've seen since the advent of the iPhone, we've slowly been trained to change our behavior the way we see things. So even with the change, I think I forgot which version was, where they changed the mouse scrolling. It was no longer the way that it used to be. It, you had to do it the way that you know, the iPhone flows for the most part. That's an example of user behavior. At first, I hated it. <laughs> this guy turned it off. So <laughs> what I'm saying is that you get used to it, and eventually you adapt. You know, unless you don't want to, then I mean, it's not for everybody. But like I said, that's why we have personas. Everybody has something that they like. 
Therefore, iPhone caters to all. <laughs> okay, so understanding the product. So on the developer side, when you want to create something, you have this is how you kind of with a, with a UX mindset you approach things. So understanding the product at a high level. So what does that mean? And I'm sure you know you guys can guess. Is essentially seeing what the product does. The purpose of the product is driven down to the core functionality. So a lot of the times we want to create all these full, all these fun features on a application. But we haven't even figured out how to solve A to B. So the thing is, what you want to focus on when you create an app, you're trying to fix a problem. You're trying to make somebody's life easier. So essentially, that's what you're trying to do. You're not trying to complicate things by adding more features. You know, that's, a, that's what I was mentioning Instagram. It's, it's such an easy thing to do. You literally did the image, the filter, and then you did the social aspect of it. And that was it. And now Instagram does other things, like it does the chats. The, it has chat functionality a little bit and does video. People still don't give a crap about video. I see like rarely like five videos a day you know, of an entire feed. That's why Vine was created, you know, for the most part. And people still use Instagram for the most part. Vine is nowhere to be seen in any huge social circle. Vine is kind of weird, but you know. All right, and then after that, after you figure out the problem that you're trying to solve, then you can start adding layers. And the best companies started with core functionality. I was telling you. So Google had did it, Facebook has done it, Every single one of them. So Facebook, the only thing that, like I said, that we had to adapt, for example, was Facebook created their chat functionality, their social aspect, and then they created a se secondary app to actually do uh, texting uh, for, I mean, for, the, for the messenger. They separated the core app and created a separate messaging app. That's kind of weird, but people have mostly just gotten used to it. You know, for them. It's kind of weird that you just press messaging app and then it just transfers you to the other app. It's kind of weird, but you, know, you get used to it. Okay. This is my methodology when I actually approach uh, a product or design uh, from a user ex experience fan. Observe people, user design. Observe people. Not take, not what's coming out of their mouth, but what they're actually doing with their hands. So essentially you develop your product, you have a user interface per se, you give them the phone and you tell them use it. And then they, you see what they do. And they can tell you, I don't like this color or whatever, I don't care about the color, just use the damn thing. See, see what happens. And you'll figure out that people tend to do certain things. So one of the things that I learned, and it's funny because a lot of this stuff was actually provided by an article that I read, um, was actually really good. The, the guy was an amazing you know, user experience designer, user interface designer, and he would give, you do exactly just that, just give him the, the phone and just test out the app. So what would happen is that people would just do everything wrong. Whatever he did, they wouldn't do. Essentially, this is, he created an outline of what he wanted people to do, like press this corner here, he would, they wouldn't do it. He wouldn't tell them anything. That's the thing, you, you exactly, you know, professional feedback is sometimes detrimental. So that's the second point is, when you are in a room full of designers or a room full of developers and you're showing your app to each other and that's all you're doing and you think you're the best things in the world, you show it to real people, they're not gonna get it. That's the thing. Sometimes you'll hit it, you know, it'll be awesome, but most of the time people don't understand what you guys are thinking. It's just you and your friends. It's just you and your you know, designer friends, you didn't developer. That's about it. And that's, that's where the problem, you run into problems. You start, like I said, you kind of, you shouldn't, like that is my next point, but you, become ob you should become objective to your design. So also, like I said, designers have egos, developers have egos, everybody has an ego. And the biggest, the biggest thing you can do, the biggest problem you can do is actually just attach yourself to your design and not be willing to change it just because people, because it, it's, it's not working. So you can have the most beautiful GUI, but it still, you know, works like you know, crap. Um, empathize with your user. So. I was telling you from the first point, observe your user, empathize. Take feedback with a grain of salt sometimes, but uh, at the same time, if, it's, if it makes sense, change it. You know, if, it's, if it's something that's, like, that's wrong with the core functionality, then you're gonna, you're gonna wanna change it. If it's something like, you know, I don't like this color, uh, you said that, but if 85 people didn't say anything, we're I think we're fine. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's just that small gap. And then the last one is design for the worst case scenario. And this one, I'll bring it up in my next, well, following, I guess, uh, the next slides. So uh, a lot of the times when we design an application, we design it with the best case scenario in mind. So, you know, this is how users are gonna use the phone, they're gonna have a great time and everything else. But what happens when everything goes wrong? Like, do you have enough uh, ways for the user to actually find their way back to the, to the main part, to the home page of the app or whatever, or the web page? Like, this is essentially gonna be taken to the extreme in the next um, slides. Details. The devil wasn't lying, sorry. <laughs> so I was trying to get cute with that. Okay, uh, so good practices for user experience. Thumb patterns. So if you notice, uh, I have an iPhone 6 Plus as well. The iPhone 6 Plus, 
when Steve Jobs, I guess, you know, passed away, um, the iPhone, fi the iPhone, was it the five that was actually about to come out or already was out? The 4S. The 4S. Okay. So the five essentially was the one that followed the golden ratio for a lot of people. So if you hold the, uh, the iPhone five, it's perfect. It fits well in your hand. You can reach every every button. And a lot of people said it, it was it was probably one of the best designed phones. It had a great metal case. Um, yeah, I have the iPhone six plus because it's huge and it's you know I can watch movies all day. I don't have a TV. So I just <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I use mostly. The problem with the iPhone 6 Plus, it was so big, they actually had you had to double tap this to bring the screen down. And that already, already ha I've dropped this phone on multiple times because you just can't, <laughs> you just can't one hand the thing on that thing, you know, you can't juggle it. So that's the problem with this phone and the 6S, uh, the Renault 6S, as these phones are too big. And like I said, we've kind of, we've learned to adapt, you know, I, like I said, Apple designed this little nice feature where you double tap and this thing bring, comes down, you can reach everything else, but at the cost of, you know, making a bigger phone. Like I said, the only way that we that Apple's going to compete in the market was if they made a bigger phone, so people could like it. And you know, so far so good. And this, I think uh, the new iPhone just broke record: 13 million. You know, uh, it's done like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah it's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm saying. So you know, it was the camera. I know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So that's some pattern. So typeface size. So a lot of times when you design an application, and it's multiple applications, they uh, the icons are small but the text is even smaller. And you're trying to fit a lot into a small space. Considering the fact that most people have enormous phones now, so you, you should be fine. But sometimes when you create a, when you create a typeface that's so small, and this is kind of blurry, but even iPhone, like I said, even, like I said, even though I love iPhone in, ma in many ways, sometimes there's a, I mean, maybe it's because I'm using the beta right now, but you, know, you guys have seen the little on the corner? Which says back to something, and it's so tiny that you, if you miss that, it's, it's <laughs> you're screwed. That's what I'm saying. So maybe it's because of the beta, but that's what I think. Tiny text, if it's not going to fit, just push it somewhere else. Just scroll to the bottom. Like I said, most people are used to scrolling nowadays. It's not that hard. Okay, swipe actions. So that's where I, where I uh, talk about the innovation part of it. Most stuff with iOS is pretty standard and straightforward. You, you, know, you, you have the, the typical swipe patterns you, you're used to for the most part. Some applications try to break that. Like one of, one of the first things when I noticed, you guys ever use Snapchat? Anybody? Snapchat? Okay, sweet. All right, so Snapchat it was kind of interesting for me when I first opened it because in order for me to actually, there was no real tab, you know, in underneath here. There was no tabbing for you to go between, like, you know, your, pr your previous messages. You can't see them anymore, obviously, because it's Snapchat. But the, w the way to reply to the user, you had to slide to the left. You know, you had to find the person you had on your list and then slide to the left, and then you would be open up to the reply section. It was just kind of weird for me because I, I, I'm usually... Usually, I don't know, I feel that sliding to the right would make more sense to me. But like I said, this is kind of more of a, more of a personal choice. But that's what I'm saying. Sometimes you, you try to add interactions to your application that won't make sense to people. And that's, that's where you run into problems as well. Like if you're trying to be innovative, I know this point was raised, I think, on the, on the Meetup page. Yeah. I think uh, it was, you know, how can you create something that will differentiate itself from everything else, you know, but not screw it up and, you know, and still be, you know, uh, not just part of the, you know, the rest of the, of the group, you know, just, and that's, that's hard to do nowadays. And that's a hard question because <laughs> you can, you can, there's a lot of apps that have these break, you know, these breaking features that essentially, you know, kind of are more gimmicky than anything else. And like I said, the, 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 I think the key for, to actually have a good application is just have really good core functionality. And for the most part, have a kick-ass marketing team. <laughs> that's actually really, no, I mean, that's kind of the, I mean, there's a lot of companies here in San Diego that have no, they don't have the recognition that you would ex see in the Valley. Like if somebody was in the Valley and they literally met with a VC and they told me, your app is awesome. I'm going to push you, you know, through all my channels, get you as much money as you need, get you the funding, get you the marketing and bam, that's it. Whereas in San Diego, somebody could have the same idea or even better idea and not get anything for it. That's what I'm saying. Also loca location was very important in that case, but that's what I mean. Sometimes uh, just, you know, you have the resources to do it. Um, when we go to the Q&A, I'll, I'll probably see if we can develop a better answer to that. <laughs> and then we have the indoor-outdoor contrast. And this is another one that just uh, good housekeeping rules is that when you design your application, make sure you're designing also for sunlight. Most people are on the go. Most desktop stuff, you're going to see it indoors. So if you go on your, on your laptop, you're going to probably look at your laptop in the indoors, like you're doing right now or anybody else. But if you're outside, you're looking at a phone in the sunlight. And sometimes you get a nasty glare. And there's some applications that I can't even look at. There's some people that are actually good, like Spotify is really good contrast because it's dark, but a few applications just don't make, you just can't see anything in the glare. I'm not saying to design specifically for that, but keep that in mind when you're designing an, an actual application. 
that you, it's actually visible in the sunlight to some degree, you know. Okay, emotional connection. So that's another reason why uh, applications work. And I used this case, I used uh, Nike. They have uh, the Nike Plus you know, application, a few other ones that they didn't put it up here. But this is, I think this is more geared towards web in this, in this part, but at the same time, it also applies to applications. So these are some of the things that designers uh, care about. So this is drilled into your head when you're in school, color theory. This is literally red goes with yellow, purple goes with green, that kind of stuff, and so on and so forth. And that literally makes or breaks an application sometimes because, like I said, sometimes when you put, in a, a very good example is a black background, neon green text, orange green text, you know, it's, it's very hard on the eyes. You just can't see that. But when you put a variety of colors, like I said, that, that makes sense that, you know, like some people use salmon and green and, and a few other... Uh, and the thing is, every single color represents something. And I know it's going to sound cheesy, but it's, it's psychological. You know, people, like, that's why the biggest fast food chains are the way they are. That's why McDonald's is red and yellow. That's why Cartoon is red and yellow. Like I said, it's not, it's not a, it's, it's a, it's a theory that makes sense. You know, people gear towards. That's why when you see an application, it's about the environment. That's why it's green and, and brown. You know, that's because it's supposed to be earthy. Um, if it's blue, that means it's, it's probably for some, you know, it's like Instagram or Facebook or any of those. You know, it's social. It's, it's nice. And it, it really depends, but that's color theory, and that, that really makes an application stand out, and that's uh, kind of the reason why a lot of people, you know, flock to new applications, and when you're looking through the app store, and you see something that just literally just like, you know, it's almost making you cry and how bright it is, but at the same time, you click it, and it actually looks pretty cool and everything else. That's, I mean, look at, and look at Snapchat again. Their little icon is a little, it's a, it's a super pale yellow with a little white ghost in the middle. It's interesting. Like I said, I, I thought it was interesting, and it looked nice. But that's also something when you keep in mind when you're designing the app icon for, your, you know, for a lot of developers, that the app icon will also be probably something that you want to focus to make sure that it stands out. And the worst thing you can probably do is put your entire logo in there. You don't want to do that. You don't want to put your logo plus your name plus everything else that you have in there. You want to put an icon. That's why you, Facebook has the F. You know, Twitter has a little bird. Simple. You don't want to add everything else. You just you can't fit. You, you, if you want to, you know... If you want to make an app work, you, might, you have to bring it out to the, ni to the icon status, not logo status. Um, str striking images. So uh, a lot of the apps that I like, um, you know, Instagram is the one that I use the most. It has a lot of good stuff. Now they have, now they have you know, ads and everything else, but they have really good ads. Considering the, the image quality, like I said, but if you want to talk about web, uh, most good websites nowadays have a very large header image. You know, about probably, you know, takes up three-fourths of the actual, you know, page. And you guys remember, are familiar with the above the fold theory? You know, back in the day, you know, everything that was above the fold was important. That's not true anymore because most people just scroll. So that's all you do. So now when you have your phone, every, th every single website has to, be, has to be responsive, has to be. <laughs> the thing is Google drops you if you're not from the, from the, from the search listings. You just, you just tank. So every website that's responsive, hey, Steven. <laughs> every website that's, that's responsive is calling him out right in the middle. Um, that's responsive, um, for the most part, their header image kind of stays, you know, front and forward. And th that's the first thing you see. Sometimes it's just a s an image of, you know, LeBron James is about to slam dunk that right now. But, uh, or sometimes it's just, it's just image with some text on top. But the thing is, a striking image really makes a difference sometimes when you have a web platform or even a mobile platform. It just makes a difference. So one of the cool things that I've seen in applications do is you have an app and they have a video running in the background of the actual app, like maybe the homepage. They have some, like, it's really faded, but you can see, like, some guys running in the background. They have a login screen. You log in. It's like a, it's like a fitness app, and that's actually pretty awesome. I'm not saying do it all the time because sometimes it doesn't work. You've got to be very subtle with these things, but that's one of the reasons why I think striking images work. And then, uh, lastly, is brand loyalty. So this one is associated more with Nike um, because once you develop a, a, a brand, you know, across all channels with regards to, you know, everything else I talked about, you have you take in, you can take certain liberties, kind of how Apple does, and charges a premium for everything. I think that with a watch costs like eighty bucks to make. The Apple Watch costs like eighty dollars to make. It's the, the most premium priced <laughs> thing that they actually have in the in you know in, the s in their store. Um, anyway, so brand loyalty. So one of the weird things I saw when I went I went to not even Nike, I went to Ross, and I found a Nike uh, armband. It wasn't even. It's not even. A <laughs> it's not even a anything. It doesn't do anything. It's just it's just an armband you put on your arm, and it's just made out of silk. That's all it is. It just, it just, and the instructions in the back, all it said was, wear stripe outwards. Like, literally wear this 
outwards. Where the check outwards? That's the only instruction that it actually had, which is actually thought it was pretty interesting. That's brand loyalty right there. And that's uh, that's when you create this creates an emotional connection with the user. Okay, we'll have questions later. So exhibit A. So this is kind of the example that I wanted to bring you with regards to user experience. That's why I wanted to make a note that user experience exists within the this web, mobile, and then outside of that, the user experience goes across all channels. So when you guys are developing an application, um, maybe for a company, you have to consider the fact that this user experience is going to extend outside of that. Um, so I'll give you an example right here. So this is a very good, uh, actually, application. It's, uh, you guys use Priceline before? I know Ahmed has. Anybody else? <laughs> but uh, the thing is, uh, for Priceline is actually pretty awesome because it gets you where you need to go in three screens. You select your flight, you select where you're going to go, and then you, you pay for your flight. And that's it. That's, it's, it's extremely simple. It's intuitive. I like it. You can choose a round trip on the tab. You can choose one way on the backup tab, the parting flights. And once you pick it, you pick your arriving flight, and boom. You're done. And it actually has a really nice one, two, three to exactly tell you where you are in the application. You know? And that's, that's it's, it's essentially a very good example of a good app. Um, then you have your My Trips down here, rental cars, hotels, but everything is, this is marginalized into three icons. You're not, bomb you're not, you're not thrown in with a million links to go everywhere. They generalized everything, they just compartmentalized everything, which is really nice. And then, like I said, they kept it simple. You know, you have the, you know, the names for the, for the um, airports, departure date, number of passengers, and then nonstop referred. Simple stuff that you see on every, then the th but the thing is, this is actually one of the hardest things to actually design for because you're trying to fit as many features as possible on one screen. And they even <laughs> managed to have some blue square extra, you know? <laughs> they managed to save space. That's, that's pretty much impossible now in day and age. But that's, this, is a, this is a 6S. This is how it looks on my 6, on my six Plus. This is massive. Um, and then, like I said, they have everything's designed, you know, it might look small right here, but it's actually pretty awesome. It's, it's pretty clear. The only thing that I noticed that is kind of weird is they have a funnel. And I know it means filter, but seeing that funnel in, in, in 3D design is kind of weird to see it. Uh, but that's about it. And that's the example I wanted to bring was this is the example of a good design, a well-designed app that does what it's supposed to do. However, the story I wanted to tell you was an article that I read. Um, and it was a great article because it was a guy who was a user, user experience designer. And he, it was in Delta, <laughs> just to let you guys know, it was in Delta, but he had a trouble with an air flight. So he had the exact same thing where he went, to he went through you know, an application that was well designed. He got to Delta, and then this is, is kind of what happened to him. He, he ended up having, <laughs> I love Tom Hanks, he, he kind of ended up uh, having to um, postpone his flight because the application only went so far. And that's kind of what I meant with user experience. So this is kind of how it went. So he had a great looking app that he, would, he uh, you know, did his all application with. And then what happened was that they, the flights for, I guess, for the entire East Coast were canceled. So essentially what happened was that the, applica the application was one of the ways that you can actually cancel your flight or could they actually rebook them. So he didn't know what to, he was like, okay, I'm going to go to the app. Obviously, you know, he went, obviously in most airlines, you don't have, you don't have good you know, reception for your phone. So you switch over to airplane Wi-Fi. Switched over, noticed that the server is just completely overloaded on the application. And that's designing for the worst case scenario. So essentially, this is, this is a lot of people who had a cancel flight who used the game application to actually book their flight. And because the server is overloaded, they couldn't just handle the volume, so they were screwed in that way. So the second way to do it is to do a toll-free call. And so he, sh he waited 45 minutes to get with a flight, to get one of those people that, you know, that is in the counter, to give them a phone number, to call this toll number, and then be on the phone for another two hours to talk to the lady to actually figure out what's going to happen with my flight, to tell him that, he, that his flight was, re was dropped three times. Then he had to rebook for the next day. So essentially, he couldn't even leave that day. So they, it was because of weather patterns. But the thing is, this is already, this is, a, this is a user experience. This is one section of it, and this is what's, what's happening outside of that. And then the other thing was that he had to rebook for the next day, and he had to wait four hours for his bag to unload that same day. The day that he's actually, that was the flight was canceled, he had to wait four hours to get his bag out. Because they had already loaded the plane, they canceled the planes, he couldn't do anything about it. So that's an example of user experience beyond web and mobile. This is, this is your app working, and this is everything failing afterwards. So <laughs> this, is a, this, is a <laughs> this is, and this is frustrated flyer, obviously. I just wanted to find, and I usually don't use, another, another rule, a good rule, is never use um, stock photography with smiling people like this. 
it's horrible, but I had to use it because I couldn't find anything in time. You know, I, I'd take a picture of my friends or something. But yeah, never use Sandy. I, I call her Sandy. I don't know what her name is. And then uh, never use the guy with a bad album cover. Okay. Uh, all right. So this kind of, I, I, I kind of drew it out to make sure what happened. You know, and this is kind of how the user experienced the mobile app on a good day. So user, mobile app, book a flight, has you as a good flight. That's, about, that's as simple as it gets. And then this is... <laughs> This is, yeah, this is kind of like cancel fly, user needs can't cancel, mobile app gives toll-free number, toll-free number is busy, user goes insane and starts murderous rampage. So <laughs> <laughs> obviously it's an exaggeration of you know, what could possibly happen, but you know, this is, I mean, if you, dude, if you've been in for four hours you know, at the airplane, plus whatever, 45 minutes, you've been literally been in the plane for eight, you've been on ground for eight hours, you literally did your flight already. You know, just, <laughs> could have yeah, walked. walked, you know, you're really tired if you had like luggage, but. Okay, it's so exhibit B through Everything else. So it didn't now I'm just gonna give you examples of other user interface no nos and things that I've seen and things that I've you know and a lot of a lot of stuff was uh, put together with different articles that I found, friends thrown through me. They knew I was talking, they couldn't make it, so they just gave me articles to read, you know, and that's that's pretty awesome. Okay. All right, so this is <laughs> this is an application, you know. And you laugh, but I've seen people, I've seen you guys, you guys are the culprits. <laughs> you guys are <laughs> you you people, you people are the ones that are to do this. So this is an application that you know probably doesn't exist anymore. But they, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think they're actually the globe spins in the, in the, oh, the whole thing. I don't know. This looks like literally like the future, but it, a horrible, horrible design <laughs> where all designers are dead. You know, <laughs> yeah, the the machine, yeah, the machines win. Really? There you go. Okay, I met with no. So this is off the top of my head. This is the three things that I saw. So too many features on one screen. So this is this is probably I mean this is literally what you would have. In the future, on your on your wrist, you know, when your phone when your phone is literally embedded to your skin, this is what you would probably see. You know, find my gas station, find you know, call for help. Um, but this is actually an, a real app. So, as you can see, you can do so many things if you want to. You know, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's what I that's what my talk was about. You know, sticking to the core features. I think it, I think I have no idea what the initial core feature was of this thing to do. I mean, do you know? Well, he makes. Okay, so it was a GPS server, and that compass is right there. That's where it is. Okay, so everything else kind of just got added on. But I would say, and anyway, resume navigation. There you go. That's these two major buttons do thing. Now imagine seeing that on a small screen. That's almost <laughs> your fingers need to be extremely small to actually hit any of these buttons. But that's what I'm saying. Too many features, no sense of hierarchy. So you really don't know what you're gonna, what you're looking at first. And then the classifications are all over the place. So essentially, he could have literally grouped some of the stuff how you saw in the airplane app where you just have some things just grouped into small icons. And then you can see, and then, then you see the, the complexity of the app. And that's a lot of the things when, you, when you're building a complex app, you want to make sure that you can show the user the least amount of stuff possible at first, and then slowly, gradually, you know, show them the rest of the application. You don't want to scare the crap out of them. OK. There's another app that I, that I found. It's fun. It's fun looking at these. <laughs> finding, finding bad examples of UI is hard nowadays, because a lot of stuff, most people you know, can you know, find their way around. But this is an a, a calculator app, and you have no, I have no idea, I, this is, I would never use this. <laughs> I have no, so the menu system is confusing, obviously, and the font and color are portraits. So you have a nice diarrhea yellow, and then you have, <laughs> you have a button that says clear, and then you have a button that says clear all. Um, you can switch from square, square feet to yard, square yards, and uh, so much functionality, so much functionality, you know? You can switch from tile wood to carpet. <laughs> nice. So I, I, I can see like two people that would use this. Probably in my in my life, I think my father's one of them. But um, this is it. This is this is the this is uh, you know another horrible example. Uh, this one's a little easier on the eyes, uh, but it still has bad hierarchy. So you still, you, I'm thinking about about Weight Watchers, but you can see that there's also a secondary menu with even more icons. So you have two menu. You have two literally two of these with nine. Um, so essentially, I mean, what do you? What does it do? You know, yeah, and the thing is you have, you can do so many things already without even logging in. That's, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, the fact that you can log, you can't, you don't have to log in to do everything. You can actually pick favorites, profile, and everything else. And, but that's what I'm saying is you, you give them no hierarchy. And I don't know what the pizza does, but apparently the cheat sheet. Also, get bad iconography. You know, what <laughs> know what your icons do. This is a chef's app, which makes sense for each feature recipes, but this style is just, this is, this is clip art. This is what you did with when, you, when you were a kid, when you had fun. But not anymore. This is, this is the real world. Yeah. And then obviously the menu bar is on top, which is kind of weird. Normally the best location is, you know, is on the bottom. Most people are trained to use that on the bottom. If you click on the top, 
then you have the you have the risk of running. This will come down. You have the risk of touching outside. You hit that icon, it opens up your shopping list without logging in. <laughs> All this fun stuff. Okay. And then this is actually a, a more toned down example. This is a lot more specific, but essentially this is this is what Gmail originally brought out when they redesigned their mail uh, application. So they had gray icons on a black background on a blacker background. So that essentially that was that was what they and then uh, if you can read, it says the one that's blocky in gray selects, the one that's blocky in gray archives, the one that's blocky in gray smacks. <laughs> so essentially, every single one of them was blocky in gray. So the optimal choice they did is they literally reversed the colors, made it gray, made it white, and it just, boom, just took off. A lot easier to see. I remember this, and this was three years ago. So this is, this is the new Gmail. that they, they learned from their mistakes. But I'm saying they pushed it, and that they, made, they made it optional. So when you actually went to Gmail, if you looked at the old one, um, they had the button that says, we're not changing till you know, this date. So you can, you can try the beta now, and you can try it, and then everything got reskinned, and you would use it. And if you hated it, you, know, you can get feedback and everything. But that's kind of how they did it. And thank God we don't have these icons anymore, because it would be really hard to see <laughs> and use. OK. So now we come to the state of design. So this is kind of where, where we, kind of where we came from, where we're at, and where we want to be. Um, so skewmorphism, if you guys are familiar with it, it was essentially when we first started with iOS, Everything was designed kind of to look like real stuff. So this is Amazon's old school, um, you know, magazine app, and you know you all these cool icons that you can see in the back. But everything was this is like hardwood, black hardwood flooring. You know, you got your you got your nice little um, uh, shelf you know, here. So essentially, it was made to look like real life because everything was still so new. We didn't know what to what to expect, and that was an example of how user experience kind of helped. You know, you bridge that gap between reality and Virtual reality. I want to. <laughs> I want to say. I want to be even brave and say it. But, <laughs> but um, you know, some of the old Facebook icons. But yeah, this is kind of like the way that we had. And a lot of it is ornamental. A lot of the stuff, you know, it was it was it was clunky. Was hard to load, and it was in a lot of animation and a lot of fun stuff. You know, but you can start seeing the the you know the beginnings of something that we familiar with. And then all of a sudden, you know, my, you know Microsoft uh, pulled out uh, this flat design style that they kind of proud of uh, with the whole tile thing they did and then the world went flat so uh yeah <laughs> and then and then the problem is the nike app which is actually pretty cool uh one of them uh, but what happened was with flat design is even though it was beautiful to look at you know a lot of the times you you really you know uh, i i personally like flat design a lot better than skeuomorphism but the problem with flat was that it created a this is actually a good example but um you couldn't actually see the buttons anymore so you didn't know exactly what you were pressing. So sometimes you would look at a, at a, at a block, at a, at a square block, and like it's a button, and you click it, it doesn't do anything. Because you didn't know, there was no uh, raising uh, or no drop shadows to showcase that, that difference. That's an example of a good, user, interface, good user, user interfaces, is that you still want to give your users enough, you know, even though if you, even if you remodel your app from the ground up, you, you go from whatever you had into a full flat design, you know, if you don't give, enough call-outs to your users, they're not going to figure it out. And like I said, it really depends also on who you're targeting. So if you're targeting millennials, you're actually going to have an, e an easier time, you know, because millennials are pretty savvy when it comes to stuff. And, you know, a lot of them, they're, they're, pretty used, they're pretty used to a lot of the call-outs, you know, like the menu's going to be on the top, the share button's going to be here. This is, like I said, this is the best way to, to navigate through an application, that sort of stuff. But flat kind of made that really hard. And the advent, you know, the the well, I guess the new change is Google's 2.0 version that they have right now, which is material design, which is very nice to look at, and they have enough drop shadows to consider it to be, you know, an actual thing. So material design is actually really good, really easy to understand. They have a huge design manual that I still have to read through because there's certain rules how you can use material design. You just can't go and do your own thing. Um, they have a certain amount of degree to the shadow, everything else, kind of like how Apple does it. Okay, and then the reigning king of a uh, user experience and user interface, obviously. <laughs> so this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is Apple's transition through, uh, through what we consider uh, the phases of um, skeuomorphism design. So notice this is an early Apple website. This is uh, when the Mac Pro was, was still a tower and it had a core Xeon workstation. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I forgot which iPhone was this, but essentially look at the tab system we had back then. It was, uh, you know, it was 3D. It was it, it had bezel, you know, had the like shade. It had two levels of navigation, and like I said, a lot of it's changed, but a lot of it's kind of stayed the same. You just kind of, and this is this was uh, this was three years ago, you know. We still have that. We still have that nice, you know, gradient bezel. You know, the iPad is now front and center. 
Um, and that's, that's the approach that Apple took. And if you notice, they changed a lot. So now the world went responsive as well. So this is when we started creating you know, gigantic images. You know, and the above the fold mentality went away. So this is, this is essentially what you see. You see the image, you see, you want to you know, you buy the iPad, and you have images scrolling through, and you can barely see what's going to be behind, no, below the fold. But that doesn't matter anymore because everybody just scrolls now. That's, that's, the, re that's the beauty of you know, user experience and user interface um, design, with especially with the new mobile age. Is that you just scroll. So the, the above the fold mentality is gone. A lot of marketing people lost their jobs because <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't adapt. <laughs> and yeah, and this is how it looks now. Uh, sorry, I cropped it out, but this essentially, you know, like I said, the this is what you see. You don't see any of this, you know, and that's that's the beauty about iPhone, I or I mean, the beauty about Apple is that they are very good at at, at trend setting, and that's kind of the reason why I bring up the Apple Store as well, is that Apple, uh, and we're an iOS group, so it's easier to talk about this. But if you buy an Android phone, you have a Android phone, and it breaks. Where do you go? <laughs> well, it depends on who your you know who your carrier is. You probably can do your insurance company, but that's about it. That's that's you're not gonna be taught how to use the, you know how to use the, do the user interface. You're not taught anything. And Apple provides you a store, and then provides you a layout that actually makes sense. So you have your salesman in the front, in the middle you have the people that register you for you know whatever whatever you know appointment you might have, and the back is all the geek squad people, all the nerds that actually hang out there. And that's what I'm saying is that they created a user experience that goes outside of the actual application, outside of their software, outside of everything they created, and give you a really good experience all around. And that's another term that I brought you, brand loyalty. You're used to it. Um, okay. And then bring you to the seven sins of user experience. <laughs> so this is the seven things that, uh, you know, this is actually a really good article also that I read, uh, provided by one of my friends. Um, but seven things you must never do. Too many features, not enough time. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of the, the one we saw prior where you saw the uh, 30 things that were going on screen right now. That's, that's kind of the, one of the biggest. So if you have features on your, if you, on your phone, you want to do, remember to stick to the core functionality. What does your app want to do? And do one thing and do it well. And that's how pretty much you stand out if, you, if that answers any, anybody's question. You want to do it well. So if you do that, you might succeed. Um, and also good marketing. <laughs> Okay, inconsistency. So say on one screen you have a blue background, the next screen you have a white background, the next screen you have a yellow background. You need to make sure it makes sense. That's why everything that Apple does has to make sense. Otherwise, it wouldn't be Apple, right? But uh, the thing is, uh, Johnny Ive takes meticulous care when it comes to, and I've noticed it. Like I said, you go through any, uh, you know, through every screen, and you say, for example, you pull up the one that has the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth. The screen in the background blurs out for a second, so you can actually see what you're looking at. So that the back screen won't, won't interfere what you're looking at. That's what I'm saying. But consistency also comes down to having buttons in different places. You know, having links that are different colors. That stuff kills an application and kills your the experience for the user because in one screen. You know, you have the back button was blue, the next screen it was, it was red. Ah, sh you know, I already messed up. So that's what I'm saying. All right, over well designing. And that's um, kind of goes back to the other, to the same example. You, you think too much about the design and therefore it looks like crap. So essentially you need to, sometimes you need to step back and kind of look, and I do it all the time. I, I'm designing for about two hours. I get, out of my, I get out of my office and I do like a lap around the, uh, the block and then come back. Because sometimes you've just been staring at it too long that it doesn't make sense to you anymore. And then when you have that, and like I said, you, also, you can also use developer, you know, feedback from friends and designers and everything else to help you out. But most of the time, you've got to make sure that you're designing an app that is practical and logical and usable. And like I said, that's kind of what we're talking about right now. Speed. If you want to add animations to your application, if you want to add all this fun stuff, don't do it. <laughs> do it. If it doesn't, make the speed go any slower. Make sure your app always runs smooth and efficient. Literally, that's my biggest reason why I switched between music applications. You know, I was using, um, I was using Spotify. Oh, actually, I was using Spotify for a while. And I realized everything took too long to load. Like, my playlist took too long to load on my application. And it maybe it was because I had a different phone, a phone company. But I'm saying is that I've, I've given up on, ad, on applications because they're just too slow. And that's a big thing. Speed is a huge uh, determining factor in how popular your app can be. Verbiage. Make sure people understand what your app does. So if you have, if you word everything kind of weird, you know, like if you say like, what, what do we do? Well, we do this, and you do it some developer speak, 
I'm not gonna understand. You gotta literally f- hire somebody that's you know like dumber than you, and then just make him like say what do you gotta say. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You gotta make sh- you gotta make sure that people can understand what you're trying to s- you're trying to get across. And last thing, uh, well, not last thing, non-standard interactions. That's more like like I said, uh, I was telling about gestures that don't make sense, uh, doing things that are too novelty that people don't understand. So you want to make sure that you you ease people in. So if you want to have something that's novelty, do one of them. Don't do three, do three. Don't don't try to make everything. Don't make your app spin. Don't make all this fun stuff. Just make it do one novelty thing that you're trying to accomplish. That's what Snapchat did. Snapchat did. You take a picture with text on top and you send it. That's it. That was that's as complicated as it got. And then they added all that other stuff. But they got the core functionality right. They got the money. They got the funding. And then now they're rich. <laughs> and then uh, I'll help in FAQ. If your application needs um, overlays and needs complicated menus and an FAQ section, you're doing it wrong. If you need an FAQ section to explain your application to somebody, you're doing it wrong. Because literally an app, an app should be pretty straightforward. You should probably be able to understand it. Just by going to the app store and reading the summary, you should probably be understand what you're trying to get to. That's it. But if you need an FAQ to make sure that you get, I mean, I can even TurboTax is easy to understand. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I literally did my tax when I was sitting in a meeting for 15 minutes. It was that easy. Like they, had, they, they have an FAQ, I think, hidden somewhere, but it makes complete sense. Their hierarchy and their layout, it just makes like, okay, boom, 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 I'm out. You just got to have interesting yeah, taxes. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, fl- freelancing is pretty interesting. But the, same. but the good thing is that, the good thing about TurboTax, it's uh, you know, how it pulls in everything else. You, so, it, I mean, a lot of it is just, it just fills in the blanks for you, which is why I like it. But we'll talk more right now in the, in the FAQ. Okay, and then the case study that I kind of used and I kind of took liberties was, you know, we talked about SDIOS. That's right, so your website <laughs> that we currently have. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it was more, it was more uh, using it because I wanted to point out some things, obviously. And like I said, if we haven't updated in a long time, it's not your fault. Um, some of the things that we, that we, that we try to get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Five years is a long time. And like I said, this is how much, how much the web has moved on, yeah. you know, from then, you know. And uh, like I said, maybe this Craigslist hasn't moved on and people still use it because it got its core functionality right. You have blue links, and you find what you need to do. You need to find your couch. You type in search. You get couch listings, and that's it. It works. It, it, it serves its purpose. It doesn't need to look pretty. They added a Mac functionality, and I was crazy about it. It was awesome. <laughs> they added, you can actually see where your actual person's going to you know, pick up the, uh, the couch. Um, but the things that are wrong with this, or not wrong, but I said things they could, they could probably change, is that um, have you guys ever clicked on this menu I- button before? It's insane. It's, there's a lot of stuff going on back there. It's a lot of stuff. So what I, what I, I think it was, the, the menu was in the right place. The, the thing is, the colors were, you know, the, are all out of place. So that's the thing. We, we stuck to the SDIOS colors, and we kind of uh, gradient, put the gradient on top of this. But the back and forward buttons don't need to really exist. Uh, you can back and forward between, or oh they can exist, but they shouldn't exist there. Uh, they can exist because most, most, web, most browsers, can, you can click back. You can get to where you need to go. Unless the site has ridiculous amount of complexity, which I hope it doesn't. <laughs> you know, I only dove so deep. Uh, you, uh, you don't really need these back buttons. This, obviously, the home page. You really don't need to say home page. You can literally just have the icon and just be the, the home page. But I'll, I'll show you the example right now. Um, this is a lot to look at. And you have three different tiers of letters looking at. And they're actually getting bigger as it's getting, as it's going down, normally it'd be the other way around. You start with the big letters and you move down. So now you're, you're doing it backwards. Um, and like I said, you have an image here uh, front and center. Um, so the first thing I look at, which is you know, actually not a bad thing, is you look at sdios.org, which is good. You know, second thing I look at is the yellow, if Apple iOS development. You completely skip all over Anthony Enthusiast and tech support, and you have this really nice, you know, <laughs> reversible, you know, like shadow on the thing. But, and then on the right-hand side, so what the focus of this web, of, you know, homepage should be is the showcasing the next event, correct? So it's showcasing who's going to be the speaking. So essentially what I'm getting at before I get to see anything is this. And maybe, like I said, maybe that's the idea. Like I make it, maybe I approached it the wrong way, but this is kind of what I did. So I just, I literally flattened the icon logo that we had, San Diego iOS group. I added, I changed the menu icon for a typical hamburger layout icon. I added a nice image on the side. I kind of wrote what our, our mission statement and then I put myself twice. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, essentially what, what, I, what I did is I, I created the upcoming meetings that are coming up and then I gave a to go archive button. And like I said, all the functionality is still there. It's in behind that hamburger icon. You can click down. But essentially, people see this. 
and they see to learn more, and then you click on that, or you can just scroll down, and you see these people. Everything else I didn't, I didn't design, because I'm, you know, I don't have time. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that I literally just, I think I solved the homepage problem, at least, when it comes to just, you have a nice image, and it tells you who's going to be speaking. And then everything else is locked away behind that, and then you can still see who is this about, and it's the iOS, and it's a group, and maybe when you click on that, you can get, you get the about section, you get everything else that you want to see. But essentially, that's, that's, uh, that's an easy way to, you know, like I said, I fixed it with like three blocks. One, two, and then this is the third one. And that's it. And like I said, you can reserve from here. And this can probably link over to Meetup, you know, and, and you actually reserve from the page. But essentially, you know, obviously, this page kind of serves more of, a, a, more of a, a landing page, per se. But yeah, that's, that's, that's my solution. Why two and not one bigger one? What? Why two and not one bigger one? Well, like I said, we, I, I, I struggle with that too. That's another example of user interest. I could, I could have made myself even bigger and then, you know, added my bio and everything else, but I kind of wanted to see people see two of them. I don't know. That's my choice. I could have made four of them, but then it would have gotten weird. <laughs> Just four times my face. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> you would be a lot, I mean, it's two. It's like the last one. Is that what you mean? Like if you have two concurrent meetings is what you're thinking. Yeah. If you have, yeah. If you have like two meetings coming up. Right. Scroll. You might see. Or current meetings. I think current meetup, the thing that I looked at today, it didn't have the data. It didn't have the location variety of stuff. I went looking around, looking around. Yeah. Well, this one had the location and everything else, but, um, you know, some of them some of them can't have it. And Jeff was really good about sending me location and everything. So he's, he's a good at follow-up, though. Ignore the landing page. Good at following up. Okay, but that's that's it, guys. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Questions, comments, concerns. One thing I've noticed when I go to websites is you can't control the font size. Yeah. So a lot of times on my iPad, mm -hmm. I can't read it. Really? I'd like even if I can blow it up. Yeah. My finger to the yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that that really depends on the on the layout you're using. So, like I said, most people can actually buy or use a different WordPress theme, and a lot of themes are very w the responsive is really good. So essentially, you know, you'll everything will kind of just like clutter together. Some apps you can get them. You can control the the font size. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you cannot get the font size control. Yeah. That's one of the biggest complaints I have. This is for websites, right? Not for mobile applications. <laughs> Yeah, no, like I said, some t like I said, some websites have a very hard time kind of condensing everything down. The biggest one for me is uh, CNN or any of those big you know, news chains. They have so much stuff they're still trying to get across to people. So it's really hard. You really need to zoom in to get on that link sometimes, and that's hard. But at the same time, that's, that's something you have to like, you give and take. Like my, the website that we had for the landing page, it was really easy to do because you have a limited amount of information you're working with. And it was very popular nowadays, the hamburger style menu uh, or hamburger style you know, like websites, block, block, block. So it's, it's really easy to, you know, to work in that space. But when you look at a new site that has so many layers of complexity, and they're trying to shove everything in your face, you know, something happened to Rand, you know, somebody had a baby, you know, then you're actually, it's, it's kind of hard. Anybody else? So what does your workflow look like? Are you using, uh, like, to prototype that page? Do you do that in Illustrator or Photoshop? Okay. Um, so normally what I do is, you know, this one I approach a little differently, but normally what I do, I take it to sketch. So I, I sketch stuff out, and then I prototype it using Balsamic, which is actually really awesome, because um, you can actually start doing user interactions and all that stuff. And then after that, I'll pass it on to Photoshop, I'll work on the mock, and then if I want to go an extra mile, I'll throw it into InVision. You guys have heard of InVision? Mm -hmm. and we'll so it's, a, it's, it's really awesome for collaborative uh, stuff, and I w my currently at Classy, I use it from with my developers. So they can literally, I can create literally a product demo you know, in a matter of hours that would go through every single screen that we have for the CRM, and it works. Like I said, and you just, you just create the links through. Um, for mobile design, I have a variety of apps. So I use an app that mirrors uh, what I'm designing on my phone. And then I screenshot all my, all my, sl all everything that I have, that I'm designing, all the screens, and then I start prototyping them. So have you heard of pop, yeah. prototyping on paper? So I use that one. So essentially, it's really easy. You just cr start making the links, and then it'll just go through all your screens one by one. So you can just test how it looks, and it's it's actually pretty awesome. I use that for mobile design, for web. Obviously, I use uh, Balsamic and everything else out. Question? Have you worked with mobile designer or web designer? 
Well, the, the, and okay. So the question was uh, working with ads and mobile design and web design. Okay. Um, well, currently I'm the I'm the visual designer for uh, for my company, so I'm literally making ads all day. Um, <laughs> literally making that's that's pretty much part of my job. But um, are you talking about you specifically? You know, using your website to promote ads. No, just like let's say you have a content page website. Uh huh. Yeah, you would keep them to the sides, probably. You want you want to keep them. Like I said, the the last thing you want to do is shovel more ads into your user. So never use ad overlays. I I hate them with a passion. Like and also the my, the my biggest gripe that I had also with YouTube is sometimes you go to the page and then everything goes black and they have a video playing of some movie I don't want to see. That's <laughs> that's that's just for me. It just pisses me off. But at the same time, um, a lot of a lot of ads that I've seen that are tasteful. Uh, I've usually stuck to the sides of the website, probably at the bottom. Like I said, sometimes it's not the most ideal place, but um, with the way the website uh, design is going, a lot of people tend to push them to the to the bottom. That's uh, that's kind of what I've seen so far. Yeah. Any other question? Good. Okay, sweet. Simon. I have a question about icons. Um, one thing that stood out to me about that first one you had is there's like way too many icons. And so keep in mind, how do you how do you approach like? Too many icons. Like, you know, this guy yeah. Wants home, this guy wants yeah. Do you like buy icon sets? Do you design your own? What's your okay. view on how many there should be? Okay. Well, it really depends on how many. Like we talked about the features that you're trying to implement to your application. So, um, if you look at uh, talk louder. You doing good. Oh, okay. So he's asking about um, icons in terms of you know how many there should be. Is there a limit? Should I do I make my own? Do I buy a, a, a set of icons? So the question is, I do both. So sometimes when you run out of time and you want to plate and you want you want to test something, you can I, I buy icon sets, um, and it's actually pretty cheap sometimes. But you can buy an icon set, you can try it out, and it depends on the client. They might want to get custom icons, and that's when you actually you know charge them by the hour. <laughs> but <laughs> but what I'm saying is because uh, it takes a while to get to really get a really good icon. And um, uh, the example that I can I'll, I'll talk to you about that example later, but the um, I I prefer buying icons most of the time because, like I said, making your own icons takes a lot of time. And in this day and age, most people are worried about. Like I said, most people will just skip over your icons. Like they'll look nice, but Instagram has one icon that looks different, which is the camera icon they have. But now everybody has a damn I camera icon. Um, you want to keep it to probably the amount of tabs you're gonna have on the bottom. Normally, you won't you won't go past five. So I, I say five icons on the main menu, maybe like on the bottom. But like I said, I'm just I'm just specifying. Some people do three, and general rule of thumb, you don't want to you don't want to go over five. And in my in my mind, at least, it doesn't make sense because then you're just confusing people with just. Like I said, I've I've you know I, I've played video games as well. So whenever I see uh, Call of Duty or any other like you know RPG, and then you have like a million you know icons for everything else like health, stamina, and everything, I, I get overwhelmed. It's it's confusing. You know, you're trying to jump into a game and just play something, and you have to look at you know you have to use like you know runes to like figure out what you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, any, anybody else? Which book? Oh, go ahead. Um, you mentioned you know uh, the trends of design going from like skeuomorphic to flat. Yeah. And how the buttons lost their drop shadows. And yeah. Like any other trends in design happening now where you think you're just going too far or overshooting? Overshooting. Hmm. Design Well, one of the fun th one of the fun things that I think uh, well, I don't know, maybe it's here to stay. I like parallax. The parallax effect where you know just an image stays, you know, a constant and then everything else kind of just moves up. Um, well like I said, I think I think uh, web design is kind of moving towards a better uh, one of the things that actually is going out of style is videos. So a lot of the times people don't watch your video anymore. And that's, that's a video count is really hard. So right now, actually like Classy, we just hired a video guy and I'm going to have a hard time, you know, like <laughs> accepting the fact that his videos are actually being watched by anybody. And that was one of the big trends that we, that we saw at the beginning of, you know, of y with people, especially like, you know, if you had a, if you had a huge nonprofit, you know, you would have a big, a big video front and center of like some African children running away, and then you would have like th for like 30 seconds you're watching somebody talk about how horrible their conditions are, but nobody has the time to watch that anymore. You know, nobody's gonna sit there for like five minutes and just literally watch an entire video unless you're really into that stuff. You know, you'll have a, a, a set amount of core users who will love it, but video is gonna go out You wanna, you probably that's why I mentioned striking images versus striking videos. You wanna have an, a good image that showcases that instead, and that's one of the trends. Like I, th I think that was it's probably gonna be here to stay. 
Um, people just don't have time to do that anymore. Yeah, anybody else? Which ad blockers are you? Ad blockers? Uh, I, you know, you say you hate them, so. yeah, so essentially I, I turned off, <laughs> there, was a, there was a point where I actually turned off um, uh, Flash on my, on every, everything else on my browser. So essentially I had to allow the, the, uh, the, <laughs> the page to load, otherwise I wouldn't do it. So um, that's the ad blocker that, well, the thing is the one at work actually has a pretty nice ad blocker. I don't know the name, but nothing gets through. So literally I have to, I have to ask for permission to get to some websites <laughs> that are like really like animation heavy. It's not gonna let, it's not gonna let go through. So it literally it's just bare bones. It's not that bad. It's a good life. Yes, sir. Question on design for the app store itself. How about ideas on that? Set up your screens, what screen should you pick? Oh, okay, you gotcha. If you have more than two, what okay. you get that to flow? Gotcha, so designing, so designing for the actual app store and, sh and showcasing which app screens you want to show, you know, and, uh, okay, so essentially you want to show the most visually striking screens because you want to get your point across. But at the same time, you want to make sure that you, you can make people understand the core functionality of your app at the same time. So um, I would probably suggest the home page is, is kind of like a hit or miss because you can <laughs> not want to stare a login page when they're looking at a preview of your app, you know, for the most part. So I would say no login page. I would probably say the feature page of the main core functionality that you do, and you know, like two backup, uh, two backup screens that you're comfortable with showing, but they have to be well designed. And you want to, you want to make sure they're well designed. Uh, that's that's the biggest thing is that even if it's like, oh, it does so much, this is the most awesome thing in the world. People don't understand that. Like I looked at this application. Um, it's it's to talk to international students um, to learn uh, languages. I forgot what it was called. Uh, one of the many. <laughs> but uh, but the thing is, the screens. M confused me even more than the actual application. I had no idea what I was getting into. It looked like I was gonna, you know, get my credit card stolen. That's what it looked like, and it, it was. <laughs> it looked so. It looked so shady. It, lo it looked, you know, and I was bad design probably also too. But it did. It showed me so much that I could do that it scared me, and I literally just I opened an application and I said, "This is my name. I want to learn Japanese." And boop, I disappeared. I didn't. I didn't ever went in again because there was so much to do that I didn't know what, I didn't know how to start, you know? I didn't even know how to make friends on that app. <laughs> it was so hard. Um, so I kind of gave up. That's what I'm saying. It's just by looking at the screens, it scared the crap out of me because I just, it didn't make, um, it didn't make sense to have that much functionality given to you at the, si oh, you know, just kind of yeah. just thrown up at you. So yeah, I would, I would probably suggest uh, the core functionality. You know, like I said, this is my methodology, stripping it down to what it does. And then obviously you can probably explain a little bit you know, of what you do, yeah. Thanks. Anybody else? Med? Okay, so I have this great idea. Okay. It's called Papyrus. Okay, <laughs> you bastard. It's okay. It's like Papyrus. Okay. <laughs> the background has to look like Papyrus. Okay. The font has to be Papyrus. Okay. What would you tell me? Uh, don't do it. <laughs> so I would, say I, would, I would just kill the app idea before it even starts, no. Okay. If you want to make an app that has, a, that is, that is Papyrus based, I would say it's Papyrus, probably use a, a Elegant font that's like thin, you know, to showcase that it's still fragile. But I would eliminate that background completely. <laughs> Any ideas to use that font? Um, there's uh, one thing that I didn't talk about is there's a um, good article I should probably one day send if I can to all of you. Is a uh, there's literally a set of fonts you're supposed to use in both web and mobile. Yeah, and essentially it's it's a small it's a small amount. No, no, I think uh, no more than five or six uh, you know fonts that are readily acceptable and, you know, legible by everybody. And beyond that, everything else is just kind of print, you know, like this is kind of the stuff in a lot of the times that we see a lot of fonts, they're usually headline fonts, they're usually old school fonts like Times of Roman, um, you know, uh, serif fonts. But most of the time uh, for, the, for the web, you want to use a sans serif font. Try to keep for a sans serif, you know, unless you're writing a book. You know, you, you want to use, uh, you know, use a serif font, you want to use Times of Roman, you want to use... Um, no, Calibri is actually no, it's a sans serif. But that's what I'm saying. So you want to make sure that you stick to a sans serif font. It's very legible to read. It's very easy on the eyes. Um, if you're writing copy on a website or mobile, you want to make sure that you don't have more than uh, like nine words, you know, going across a line. If you after you have a website, uh, but if you're doing mobile, like I said, mentioned, make sure you have legibility. No black on neon. Sorry. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, anybody else? Question. What's your um, opinion on push notifications and uh, badges versus uh, notifications, like that notification tray? 
Uh, so what's my opinion on notifications and push notifications? Okay. Um, I hate them. <laughs> Honestly, God, I hate them. Um, they <laughs> the thing is, because I actually, I don't, I don't know, this is a bad user experience, probably on my head. I don't know how to turn off the one for fantasy football. I don't know. I don't, I don't play football. I don't like football, per se. Uh, I like watching. I like playing it, not watching it. But I, I signed up for this, for this uh, fantasy football league, and I have no idea how to turn off the functionality for the push-up notification. So essentially, I get them every day. So <laughs> every day, I know a new player that got injured on my team. Every day, I'm knowing I'm losing. So, <laughs> so it's great. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Is, it's that, for me, it's a bother. Unless you like being, you know, especially if you, most people are at work. You know, unless you're a teenager looking for something to do, it's great. You know, it's, it's great a way to, to, you know, to get people riled up about something. But if you're in an office seven days a week and your phone is going <laughs> the entire time on your table, it's not great, uh, especially if you're in a meeting. So uh, I, I don't like push notifications. Every single app, I turn them off that I have. The only one that I probably have on is my messages. Uh, and then maybe if I'm feeling adventurous, Facebook. That's, that's, that's about it. I turn everything off. I don't like them, personally. Yes, sir. Where do you find UX design? Where do you find them? Um, some of the best UX designers are actually psychologists. Weird, right? So, uh, so I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> but uh, but I know that a lot of design uh, UX designers think with a different part of the brain. Uh, it's going to sound really technical, but um, a lot of designers, UX designers, are better at s that are psych psychologists. You know, and, uh, are better at dealing with human behavior. So they already have those patterns kind of ingrained with me. So I have a friend that I, that I you know that I talk to sometimes, and she is a psychologist, and we're going through like a set of, t of you know, we're, we're just talking one, we're asking each other questions and everything else. And then by the end of the night, it's, it's she tells me that I get predictable. You know, like it's, it's, it's kind of like, it, you know, it's, it sucks, you know, because <laughs> you're talking to somebody like that. But essentially, you, you because you fall into a pattern, You've, you fall into something, okay, he's going to ask me about this, about my day, he's going to go. And so she kind of like analyzes that in that sense. So that's literally UX user experience. You're, you're trying to create a pattern of human behavior and change that for the better. So kind of the way that I saw it, if, if you want to think of it this way, I was still born before the internet was, you know, a thing. So essentially I had to train my, I was scared of computers when I was a kid. I literally had a computer for like three years and I was just like shy. I wouldn't touch it. I was so terrified of it. I don't know why. So essentially, you know, it's like, it's like the, uh, the movie, uh, what's it called? Um, the one where the, this, it's a big black obelisk, uh, Space Odyssey. Yeah. Essentially, that's what I kind of <laughs> felt like, you know, except in my jammy jams. Uh, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I know, right? Just terrified out of a white box. Um, so what ended up happening was that you, we ended up getting, all of us got trained, you know, to use, to use these phones, um, especially, you know, like, you know, smartphones. Uh, none of us, and considering my nephew, who was literally born, so my, ne my nephew is, you consider this, he was born into the internet. So for him, it, is, it doesn't, it never, it's always been. So for him, Wi-Fi has always existed. YouTube is always there, you know. So him, he just, he literally just is a natural. He's been using the iPad since he was two, you know. It took me a while to figure everything else out. So that's kind of the other point that I wanted to make uh, was just uh, usability is different for different people. Uh, millennials are a lot easier to, you know, get the hang of things a lot faster. Your older generations, my dad can still kind of operate his phone. My dad's hands are like four, just these weeny fingers are huge. So he literally, and he's like, you know, he works construction. So when he touches his phone and he has a 4S, you know, he just, he just looks like he's breaking the phone every time. And he's actually broken three phones in a year uh, because he literally just, you know, just crushes them into a diamond. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's a construction worker, so they're all tough, you know. Um, and beer spilled all everywhere. Yeah. My question is, I mean, I think I'm going to look on Craigslist or something. Where do I, if I'm a developer and I've got an app and you just convinced me I need a UX design, yeah. where do I get someone tomorrow? Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right. Um, you're probably going to have to go through LinkedIn or a recruiter. So the thing about UX designers is that usually they, they come as they come off as UI UX designers. That's kind of the point I told you is that I'm a, I think I'm a better user inter user interface designer than I'm a UX designer, because even though I sometimes empathize with users, you have to put yourself in a position where you have to think like a user, and that's hard sometimes to do because you think people are stupid, right? <laughs> but um, if you want to get a user experience designer, it's it's hard. Um, a good one, especially like some of the best brands actually have really good ones, but. Uh, if you want to get another one tomorrow, you should probably try LinkedIn or try any of the any of the recru any of the recruiting uh, websites that exist right now. That's probably the easiest. They're not going to be walking around just like you know Joe Schmo, and you just, or they hang out in coffee shops. Go, <laughs> I'm sure they hang out in Starbucks. Go find one of these guys. I hang out there. I met hangs out there. I know a few of my friends do too.
Yes, sir. How about the uh, San Diego Association of Graphic Arts Organization? Do they have? I know they have the ability to post jobs. Stuff San Diego like Association they, of Graphic Arts. Are they focused on UX or are they just mainly traditional? Are you talking about uh, what's the name of the? Uh, what's the? Like San Diego AIGA. Oh, AIGA, yeah. yeah. AIGA was huge when I mean, we were in school. That was probably the, uh, our only link to the outside world uh, because they also do the Adobe conference, which is pretty sweet. Um, what are they mainly Christian? They do everything. They, do they, everything. they, they, go, they do across the board. But for a while, when I was in school, they, they focused man only on print and going to museums and all that fun stuff. But they, uh, they've changed over the years. Sadly, our curriculum at school hasn't. But, <laughs> but yeah. I got. I would be good too. And they are, they're always they have a set of designers they can actually give out to people. There's just a, actually there's two meetups in San Diego. Yeah. Using UX. Yeah. So if you look up on the meetup. There's one called San Diego Experience Design. Yeah. And then there's UX Speakeasy. Yeah, the UX Speakeasy is the other one. That's the other big one. And they, yeah, they have some really good people there too. So you want to hunt user user experience designers? You should probably try there. Um, there, like I said, the, it's it's a different. Like I said, it's a different breed for user, user experience designers because, like I was telling you, you have to think differently. And uh, creating personas is not easy because they do a lot of research that goes unnoticed. A lot of times, you, most, peop most companies are hiring a UX designer and a UI designer because they could focus on their task individually and they're good at you know, either of them. Instead of becoming a full stack designer, like a full stack developer, you're jack of all trades but master of none. You know? And so you're just kind of worthless. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, this may be more particular to Chris. Oh, right yeah, the IoT meetup and the uh, silent intelligence meetup, they've had uh, UX people in, in our group meetings that are deeply involved in those technologies, so that's another option. Thank you. No worries, <laughs> of course. Any more questions or concerns, comments? I found a website. <laughs> you're, not, you're, you're killing me, man. You're killing me. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for having me today. Yeah. <laughs>